Hello, and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, we'll be talking to Drs. Wafa Malik and Patrick Durand about reducing nitrogen pollution into coastal waters. Coastal water pollution from agricultural sources is a major issue worldwide, leading to algal blooms, dead zones, and more. Several efforts have been made to reduce this problem, but for more sustainable and effective solutions, the root causes of these nutrient emissions need to be addressed. This episode, Wafa and Patrick share their research on the systems they're using to model potential solutions and just how effective these solutions may be. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today, we have Wafa Malik and Patrick Duran with us. Wafa Malik is a postdoctoral researcher at the National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food, and the Environment, or INRE, in Rennes, France. She holds an engineering degree in natural resources management from the High School of Agriculture in Mogran, Tunisia, and earned her master's degree in integrated planning for rural development and environmental management from the Mediterranean Agronomic Institute of Zaragoza, Spain. She was awarded a doctorate in agricultural and environmental sciences by the University of Zaragoza, Spain. She subsequently held a postdoctoral position at the University of Kentucky in Kentucky, USA. Her current research interests focus on how to change agricultural activities and land use management to enhance environmental sustainability and agricultural productivity using agrohydrological methods. Patrick Durand is a senior scientist trained in agronomy, soil science, and hydrology. His early works were on mountain catchment acidification and hydrology hydrology in the University of Orléans, France, and in the Institute of Hydrology of Wallingford, UK, with Dr. Colin Neal. He got a permanent research position in INRA, Rennes, France, in 1992, where he began to work on agriculture, diffuse pollution, and nitrogen cycling in rural areas. He contributed to the development of several catchment models, such as Inca and TNT2, both for research purposes and for policy support. Hello, Patrick and Wafa. So good to have you on the show. Thank you for your time today. How are you doing? Quite well. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having us today. Hi, Ari. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you for having us on the show. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So happy to have you. So today, if people weren't able to guess some of this from your lovely bios, we are talking about eutrophication, um, the nitrogen pollution that, that occurs in different regions, specifically in Brittany, France. So if you could start us off by telling us just a little bit more about eutrophication, like how you would define that term, and also how that comes into play specifically in Brittany. Okay. As uh, as you may know, eutrophication is, uh, uh, it means an excessive load of nutrients uh, coming into an ecosystem and causing, uh, causing severe disturbance to these ecosystems. So it has different forms, different symptoms. It can be harmful uh, microalgae blooms. It can be uh, dead zones due to lack of oxygen in the, in the water, fish scales, red waters, etc. In Brittany, uh, it's particularly the problem of uh, green tides that is acute. The green tides, it's the tremendous development of uh, a sort of seaweed, a macroalgae, a green seaweed, uh, which is not toxic at all, but it tends to accumulate in, in large proportions and making heaps on the beaches, which is, which cause a lot of uh, nuisance and uh, even uh, problem problems for, for the health because uh, when these, uh, these heaps are rotting, it, uh, it emitted uh, different, gas, uh, different sort of gases and especially hydrogen sulfide, which is a very poisonous gas. So, so this is quite a very 
problematic issue in Brittany. And uh, previous studies have shown that uh, the main cause of this uh, phenomenon is the excessive load of uh, nitrate nitrogen coming from the streams that feed uh, the coastal areas. And this nitrate, nitrate nitrogen come from, mainly from uh, agriculture. And indeed, Brittany is, uh, is a region, uh, is one of the major regions of, uh, for agricultural production in Europe, producing mainly uh, animal products, uh, dairy, cattle and meat cattle, pigs, uh, poultry, etc. So, uh, in the in the past, of course, uh, there has been many mitigation policies that have been uh, implemented and indeed we have managed to reduce the nitrogen loads by about 30-40% in, in most of the areas. So this is this is going better, but it's not enough to get completely rid, uh, rid of, uh, of a problem, and especially when the weather is particularly favorable to the development of this seaweed, uh, we may have a very large green tides until now. I just didn't realize that weather could have such an impact on on that phenomenon, so that's that's news to me. <laughs> yes, and Brittany is not the only region that is affected by this phenomenon, and uh, the the most impacted, the most famous impacted region is in China, where the some beaches in the south of China are completely uh, full of. Uh, Tons and tons of weeds. It's really quite quite impressive to, to see, <laughs> and yeah. and it is widespread in uh, in every places where you have a mixture of uh, diffuse pollution coming to the sea and uh, quite uh, calm waters. It can it can happen. Sure, sure. So. Your research then was specifically studying some different mitigation strategies that you can use to uh, advance further the mitigation that you have already done in that region. So I know you wanted to speak specifically to the description of this coastal region and its kind of geographical context that might set this region apart from other regions that deal with this issue. Um, so I wanted to give you an opportunity to do that before we hop into what you tried. So if you could <laughs> go there. Yeah. So uh, specifically in our study, we we chose the, to focus on the striking case of the saint brieuc Bay. It is uh, located in northwest of France, and uh, which is one of the most uh, heavily impacted bay by large algae, algae blooms in Brittany, um, accounting for over 70% of the total algal standing area in all Brittany. So in fact, <clears throat> this bay is fed by three main coastal streams that collectively drain an expansive watershed covering uh, uh, 800 uh, square kilometers. So it is a rural area that char it is characterized by gentle slopes and uh, mild oceanic climate. I mean that uh, with annual rainfall more than 700 millimeter and mean annual temperature around 11. And basically the landscape of this region is dominated by intensive agriculture uh, livestock which uh, um, including indoor, big breeding, dairy, cattle, and poultry. And the land use consists of uh, approximately uh, one-third dedicated to grassland and one-third to winter cereals and one-third to silage maize. Okay. And um, so then you were trying to find mitigation strategies that would work specifically in this region, but hopefully also have use elsewhere. So 
what were what were the methods that you or strategies that you were looking at with this and how did you test <clears throat> to see if they would work <laughs> yeah great questions so in our study we aimed to assess uh, efficiency of a different nitrogen mitigation strategies to reduce nitrogen emission to coastal water in this bay and um as patrick mentions before that there is a uh, the previous mitigation plans have uh, focused uh, mainly on implementing practices that align with European Union regulations. So, for example, uh, these practices include adjusting fertilization rates uh, to match crop requirements and reducing the excess of nitrogen from livestock and introducing catch crop after a summer harvest. Um, but... Um, um, this for achieving further reductions in nitrogen losses require more uh, drastic changes. So we, um, we evaluated uh, two potential strategies. Uh, the first one uh, was um, to extensify a limited part of the area, principally in the valley, valley bottom and I mean, this approach uh, aimed to reduce the overall nitrogen pressure and intercept nitrogen losses from upslope uh, field whose management remain unchanged. So in practice, I mean, this is um, means to increase the percentage of agricultural land conversion into unmanaged grassland from a downhill to uphill. And the second one, the second scenario um, consists on changes um, in crop systems across the entire air area, aiming at limiting nitrogen input and maximizing efficient soil coverage by nitrogen catching vegetation throughout uh, all seasons. Uh, because, you know, in Brittany, um, it's known for its humid and mild autumn and winter conditions, and with soil exhibiting high mineralization potential. So it is crucial to establish actively growing vegetation cover during these seasons. So, which is in contrast to conventional rotation based on silage uh, or maize uh, or grain maize and winter cereal in this region. So in practice, this scenario involves decreasing uh, spring crops, uh, with, which cannot be floyed by catch crop, replacing winter cereals by uh, catch crop and spring cereals, and uh, replacing all mineral nitrogen with livestock influence and avoiding uh, potential over-fertilization. So um, these two scenarios uh, then were combined, and uh, we compared uh, uh, this, these scenarios to the reference scenarios uh, that correspond to the combination of current land use and agricultural practices. And um, this leads us to uh, the, our research questions, uh, which are, um, what's the efficiency of each scenarios? And um, what's the response time of uh, the system of the two options? Um, I mean, what's the time delay between the implementation of nitrogen mitigation measures and the full-time effect on water quality? And, uh, and what reduction could be result from the combination of the two options? <laughs> everyone. I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? Waffle and Patrick's paper, Nitrogen Mitigation Scenarios to Reduce Coastal Eutrophication, published in Agrosystems Geosciences and Environment, is always freely available. If you are a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, you can take a quiz for continuing education units for this episode, which can be found in our show notes or on certifiedcropadvisor.org. Let's get back to the show. Sure. So uh, modeling is always just a, a hard topic for me because it's very complicated. <laughs> and I always <laughs> kind of struggle, but I'm going to make an attempt to ask some clarifying questions and please just correct me if my questions are the wrong type of question to ask about a model. Uh, so 
what what are some of the um variables that you are testing in these like is it the percentage of area that you're converting is it where along that slope you're converting you know different ratios of different cover crops or which catch crops you're using like what what are the factors that you are uh toying with in in this model to tweak your design Mm -hmm. so (laughs) good question uh, so, for for example, um, for the first scenarios that I described about the conversion um, agricultural land used to unmanaged um, uh, unmanaged and um, ungrazed grassland, uh, we used the um, the, the conversion uh, began from the wettest part of the landscape, uh, which were uh, determined using a topographic index. And uh, this conversion process ranged from zero to 100% of the total area. So we began uh, the index. Um, we began from uh, the down down the um, down slope, and we progressively go to the uh, uphill. So, and uh, we tested uh, several percentage, like for example, zero or three percent, ten percent, twenty percent. Uh, until one hundred percent, and for the uh, the the second one, the, which is that consists of the changes of the all the area, the system, the production system of all the areas. So, um, with a script, we can detect with uh, the the agricultural practices uh, that we have uh, to change, and also the land use um, that cause uh, the most. Um, nitrogen losses to convert it to, uh, for example, um, spring cereal or catch crop and spring cereals. Okay. I I have additional questions about the models. (laughs) So I know you had mentioned using like livestock effluent. Does your model care what kind of animal that you're using? I know you mentioned that there's cattle and pigs and poultry is that something that's a factor or is there just a this is the effluent number (laughs) or series of numbers that we're plugging into the equation how how does that interface with this um the model that we use um absolutely it it can differ we differ the different effluent and uh uh we manage the different uh different effluent uh with the the um, different agricultural area for uh, for the crops. So the model differentiates uh, between the different effluents of uh, um, poultry, uh, beaks, and uh, um, yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, sorry, I I am on a I'm on a roll now. Um, <laughs> so then. Is that based off of what is already there in the sense of, oh, there's a poultry farm there, so it's reasonable that they would use poultry effluent there? Or is it, this would be nice if we could change all of these to dairy farms because the dairy effluent had the best results? Or uh, how does that work? (laughs) Maybe I can help (laughs) for this. (laughs) Uh, So, indeed, we, the, the the setup of the model is based on the actual situation as as detailed as possible con- uh, taking into account the data available in the area and uh, when we design the scenario where, when we change the type of crops we 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 saw uh, the type of uh, <coughs> cereals and set etc we take into account the consequences in terms of agricultural systems. Uh, for example, uh, <clears throat> if we increase the area of grassland and decrease the area of uh, silage maize, we will have less area to spread uh, big slurry, for example. So, we 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 take that into account in the model, and, and at the end of this uh, of this 
taking into account all the, the consequences of the change we, we simulate, of course, we obtain different type of uh, farm. And uh, the interesting thing in, uh, in the consequences of these scenarios is that, uh, which is not uh, what we expected, but in fact, uh, we tend to specialize the farms, which means uh, in uh, in Brittany many farms have both pigs and uh, and cows, for example, or or cows and uh, and poultry, and uh, the the result of the scenarios was we have to specialize the farm to be more efficient and to. To, to have consistent uh, crop rotation for each. And the other consequence is that uh, we were uh, obliged to uh, hypo hypothesize an exportation of all the poultry uh, effluents. We have no, no space more for poultry effluents. So we can keep the poultry running, but we have to export the effluents if we, the scenario would be feasible. Okay. See, I, this is what I love about modeling work is because there is always that fine-tuning, and I love being able to compare what the data says versus what is physically possible on the space or, you know, what is financially possible for the people that are actively living on, you know, it may not be possible for every, you know, farmer to completely change their farm to fit the best model. And so it's, it's always fun for me to see how researchers approach those questions of what is most important to test how detailed do we need to be you know does it do we need to split out between different types of effluent or not do we need to test you know these two types of one crop or can we just kind of have an average <laughs> number that we plug in so i love those fine details um but as you have already mentioned some of the research uh results and i don't want to spend too much time <laughs> getting bogged down in in the methods because i could certainly camp there for a very long time Tell me more about your research, uh, your results, and what you found. <laughs> well, the 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 main message, uh, the m most important results of this study of this modeling exercise, it's it is still possible to reduce further nitrate loads. Uh, in this context, which was not completely evident, uh, where because there has been a lot of uh, regulation uh, 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 where the, flam uh, uh, the farmers have to comply to to, to very strict uh, rules to to manage their nitrogen, but it's still possible to to go further. But it's it's not going to be easy. <laughs> uh, the the first scenario, the scen scenarios of uh, conversion will achieve uh, something like 30% reduction of nitrogen loads in about five years if we convert between 5 and 10% of uh, catchment, which can be uh, seen as not very much. But of course, if a farm has most of his uh, farming area in these <laughs> bottom lands, it would be problematic for for him to go on. So uh, <clears throat> uh, this is our, the first result. The second scenarios, uh, so the generalized change of agriculture, would achieve the same uh, reduction, but only in 10 years. And uh, with uh, it would be more difficult, more, uh, slower, and uh, especially the, the the concentration in summer, which are the most uh, problematic for 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 the blooms, for the algae blooms, would uh, would stay higher for a longer time. Uh, and if we go for the extreme scenario where we change, we 
get rid of all the agriculture and only put uh, grass, grassland, uh, extensive grassland, we would achieve a 50% reduction of nitrogen load in 15 years, which means that uh, we still have a very large nitrogen legacy in the soils and in the ground waters in this area, which can be a little bit surprising because the, the, this is an area with relatively shallow soils and a shallow groundwater system. It's not an area with very deep and big groundwater bodies. So even in this type of system, we, we still have to account for a very large legacy of nitrogen indeed. <clears throat> and uh, there is another bad news <laughs> in, in our study, is, uh, and it doesn't come directly from our study, but from, we were doing this project with uh, other scientists working on the modeling of uh, or the algae specifically. And uh, the result is even with 30% reduction of uh, nitrogen loads, uh, we, are we are still in a situation where we can get our uh, algal blooms not every year, but every uh, three or four years, and sometimes very large algae blooms. So if we really want to get rid of all uh this phenomena either we have to get rid of agriculture which is not an option because <laughs> it's one of the most productive area in uh, in Europe so it would be problematic but the other solution is to go for very more radical changes uh not not staying in the same types of system but going into more agroecological systems, taking full use of uh, ecosystem services of the soils and so on. Where some of these systems are more or less known, but most of them needs to be uh, to be developed uh, in the future. And uh, there is still a lot of research to go on on this type of uh, situation. Sure. Okay, I have a question, and if this is not something that you feel you have, like, the expertise or just don't want to, like, <laughs> go there, uh, feel free to just, like, veto the question. So you mentioned that if if you were to convert some of the agricultural land into, like, a managed grassland, if, if there was a farmer that was – was like I'm the farmer on the coast. <laughs> I'm on. I'm the very bottom rung. It, it, does France have programs to be like? I'm sorry, you can't make money from farming that land, but here's like some kind of recompense for you taking that out of production. It, like, are there programs for that? Obviously, in the United States, I I don't know a lot <laughs> about how that works. <laughs> no, in France, you don't have that neither. Because uh, yes, farming is a is a private activity, and we can you cannot uh, <coughs> uh, forbid somebody to to farm. Uh, we do have regulations. We do have programs uh, of incentive to change the type of agriculture you made, and there is also another possibility, which is uh, I don't know if it's really a good news, but. Uh, in France, we are like in in most uh, developing developed uh, countries. We are l losing a lot of farmers every year, so a lot of area is uh, is freed. So we could imagine, but well, we are not in a in a very authoritative country, but we could imagine some kinds of land exchange between the farmers who want to go on and the farmers who quit. Uh, so it, there is still some degrees of freedom in uh, at this level. And this is actually what the different policymakers are thinking about uh, to implement uh, right now. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious because I don't know a lot about how countries in Europe regulate that kind of thing or, or not. 
Um, so you mentioned already that there is much research that can still be done on this topic and finding ways to improve our status on this issue. So tell me more about what are the future research questions, um, whether that's something you're working on specifically or just in general. Yeah. Uh, so um, in the forthcoming steps, you, you we um, aim to couple the TNT2 model, the model that we used in this study, which uh, calculates the nitrogen loads reaching uh, the coastal areas with a specialized uh, ecological model designed for coastal ecosystems and specifically uh, designed to uh, estimate the proliferation of algal blooms. So um, this merge will uh, provide us uh, with the ability to simulate algal growth under the various scenarios that we have uh, tested or explored and to have their impact on the algal uh, bloom proliferation. And um, moreover, um, our future research goal will involve um, the co-design of the eutrophication management strategies and the development of adaptive public policies. So it's a co co collaborative effort that will bring together farmers, local authorities, uh, stakeholders uh, to devise uh, design innovative strategies that strike a balance between environmental sustainability and agricultural productivity. So it's an exciting path forward toward a more sustainable and harmonious uh, coexistence uh, of uh, agriculture and environment. I love that. Yeah, balance coming up again. So, so uh, man. <laughs> I just, I have the utmost respect for people really fine tuning those different balances in play. That's incredible work. So thank you so much for your time already. I have three questions left for you. The first one is where can listeners go to learn more about this research? Well, uh, of course, we <laughs> we have several papers written about this because it's uh, we developed the TNT2 model in the early uh, uh, 2000 so we still have quite a few papers on that <clears throat> and more generally if you google uh, coastal eutrophication we, you will get a lot of internet resources about uh, the question and uh, specifically some website in about Brittany uh, problem. Uh, some of them are in English, but of course, most of them in French. Uh, and there is even there are even two movies and one comics made on uh, on this. Uh, so I I don't think they have been exported to other countries, but uh, yeah, they, they will. I think since they have had some some success they will be available in the on the platform very soon and uh, more generally our institute in ray have have posted a lot of uh, resources about the relationship between uh, agricultural agriculture and the environment in the in the Euro, in the french and european context so yeah you have to i cannot point you to very specific uh, resources, but it's easy to find. Perfect. Yeah, we will include uh, links to any of those that we can find in the show notes. Otherwise, happy happy hunting, everybody looking for, for those details. Um, the next question is if listeners want to take the next step to get involved with any of these things, what can they do? And that can be researchers who might be interested in doing this kind of research it could be general public looking to interface with those public officials or just wanting to take measures to stop eutrophication in their own systems any anything like that what would you <laughs> suggest uh well for the general uh, public uh i would say that as a as we said 
eutrophication and more generally environmental problems related to agriculture are very widespread nowadays. And to change that, we need to think about uh, the way we are eating, the way we are buying food, the amount of money we we dedicate to to alimentation, to food, uh, as compared to other more maybe less es essential needs we have, and uh, and the sort of thing we eat too, because uh, it must be admit and it is uh, admitted uh, now that a lot of problems come from uh, it intensive uh, farming system so probably if we want to solve uh, this problem we need to to eat less meat in our diet that will be good for the planet and that will be good for our health too <laughs> uh, so this is for the for the general public, more specifically for the for the scientists, I think they have to they have a role to play in in this process, especially by designing innovative agricultural systems, not only based on technology, because uh, it's not always possible to implement technology everywhere, and it will cost cost resources. But also, as I said, in the designing system, more relying on uh, ecosystem functioning, ecosystem services, and uh, some some system, uh, actually many of them designed by by farmers, by empirical uh, knowledge, uh, uh, can be quite producive. So I think it's there is a way to to develop. Uh, such cropping system more more efficient and uh, and uh, environmental friendly and uh, but to do that uh, it's probably necessary to get out of the laboratory and to to make as Wafa said uh, participatory research with farmers with uh, policy makers with all the stakeholders which is not easy because they have contending uh, 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 contending uh, ideas and uh, and values and so on so it's not easy but i think it's necessary because it's it's an essential essential problem of our planet nowadays all right. That is some great advice for many types of people. I have one question left for you. What is one fun fact for each of you that listeners wouldn't know if all they had was your research? <laughs> Patrick have something to say that <laughs> discovered last year. We, we have uh, something in common, Wafa and I, but it's not really... It's not completely Same. common. <laughs> it's not completely <laughs> common. Uh, we are both uh, passionate dancers, oh. but not the same type of dance. Okay. <laughs> I, I am uh, uh, a dedicated uh, tango dancer, Argentine tango dancer, but I think it's not the favorite dance uh, for Wafa, and she, maybe she will say more about that. <laughs> Mm, so my my horse is the um, bachata dance. So I don't know if, and this is what uh, Patrick discovered last year when he invited me in his uh, house and uh, a party with her his family, and uh, <laughs> and uh, it was a kind of sort of a game um, to do something. Um, and and I choose to dance with my pair, um, the bachata. And uh, it didn't take long for other guests to join us on the floor to dance. <laughs> <laughs> so it was cool, yeah. And uh, full of fun, filled evening and a memorable event. Yeah. So thank you, Patrick. <laughs> You're I'm, welcome. I'm looking forward for the next invitation. <laughs> it will come soon. 
Oh, I love that. Yeah, I uh, I've done a little bit of tango myself, but not Argentine. I wasn't I wasn't that far yet in my dance journey. Last I left off, but those are both wonderful dances, super fun. Um, and what what a fun fact that you are able to share that. That's that's delightful. As has <laughs> been you. this entire conversation. I have learned so yeah. much. I appreciate. Uh, everything that you are doing to help Brittany and also other researchers dealing with similar issues. So thank you for your research and for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much for you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Good. Me too. for listening to Field Lab Earth. More information can be found in the description below. Thank you.